welcome to our live stream. Uh, if you're in the chat, thank you for being here. If you're catching a replay, I appreciate you taking the time. And as you can see, we have this wonderful guest here, Dr. Alan Hildebrand. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Hildebrand. It's a pleasure. Thank you for being here. And it also looks like there's some people in chat. We've got Homestead, Aquarius, Prepping by Faith, Storms, Radios and Cats, Sassy Girl Prepping, the Virginia Bushcrafter, Cold War Prepper, and others. Uh, thank you all for being here. Sorry if we missed you. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, why we've invited Dr. Hildebrand here today. Um, we are, of course, a channel that cares about emergency preparedness, and we try to link it with actual natural hazard events. And we like talking about specific events, and there is no person who understands natural disasters I could think of um, more thoroughly than Dr. Hildebrand. So thank you again for, for joining us. And um, I've known Dr. Hildebrand for a while. I had the pleasure of being his teaching assistant a few times for geology field courses. And then most recently, we, we rafted the Colorado River um, through the Grand Canyon, 188 miles. And I got to uh, the privilege of listening to some of uh, Dr. Hildebrand's discussion about studying some of these things like the asteroids and meteorites and also the um, discovery of the Chicxulub Crater. Thank you for being here. And I was wondering, um, could you tell us a little bit about your research interests so that people understand a bit about what you do? I'm well, interested in rocks in space, I guess, how they interact with the planets and well, what they have done in our planet. So of course they make impact craters and eject layers, uh, things like that. And uh, currently, I well, study asteroids. Uh, we try to recover meteorites when they fall, and we just we're analyzing meteorites of various types to to measure their properties. So I remember running into you in the elevator a couple times when you're on your way to the field, and you're going out, and you had field assistants, and you were going and walking around looking for meteorites. Like, how do you even know where to go? Well, a lot of people think meteorites are hard to find, but they actually do everything they can to tell you where to find them. Because when they come into the atmosphere, they make this huge light, which we call a fireball. So you get a big streak of light across the sky. And these days, there's more and more digital devices. People have their phones or more and more security cameras, etc. So we often have more than one video record of a fireball. And with two, you can triangulate where it is in the sky. Of course, figure out how fast it's going. And with that information, you can, you know, with the well, the right software, you can say, well, those meteorites should have fallen here. So, so you can go out and look. It's a lot easier game than it used to be because we have so many camera records these days. And um, what are you actually looking for? I mean, how do you know they're not just rocks? <laughs> well, they are just rocks, but well, I believe the Van City Pepper, of course, is a geologist too. And I mean, you get into the rock game, you can tell what kind of rock a rock is. And, and meteorites are different. Most of them really quite different than any rock we find here on Earth. So. If you're a rock person, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you probably need a really good straps on your backpack to, to carry them around and stuff because they're heavy. <laughs> well, uh, we rarely find enough <laughs> consideration. I mean, just one is enough to make us all happy. Yes. And um, just for anyone who's interested, uh, just a little bit of background about Dr. Hildebrand. He finished a Bachelor of Science at the University of New Brunswick and then went on to do a PhD at the University of Arizona. And uh, he studied the geochemistry and stratigraphy of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary impact ejecta. And that study allowed for the uh, shedding some light on the extinction event of the dinos uh, caused by the Chicxulub asteroid um, at the end of the Cretaceous period. So what does that what does that really mean? Well, 
you know, your show is about natural disasters, so I guess you could say that's one of the biggest natural disaster we've had in the last hundred million years, anyways. And that asteroid that hit us was about I'll say eight kilometers in diameter. Released a tremendous amount of energy, I mean, changed the atmosphere composition. Did this whole litany of things, drove the non avian dinosaurs extinct, drove the pterosaurs extinct. Uh, of course, many forms of life, you know, people say, well, the mammal survival, many mammalian species also went extinct, but, but we squeaked through while the non avian dinosaurs didn't. So, change the course of evolution on our planet and uh, well makes you wonder how many other random acts of chance have influenced evolution on our planet yes um and we did we did have a question beforehand about if it hadn't hit us you know what what do you think might have happened well, if you're in the context of the evolution of life, uh, a scientist who used to be in Ottawa, Dale Russell, he actually speculated that the dinosauria may have involved intelligence. And well, back around 1990, the late 1980s, he, he said, this is what an intelligent dinosaur would have looked like. He speculated and made a you know, it's approximately six foot high mock-up of what an intelligent dinosaur would look like. And the real question comes down to, I guess, you know, what, when do we evolve the, the higher form of consciousness? I mean, you know, people that study dogs, I read once, dogs about as smart as a two and a half year old. But you know, we would say they have a, a much smaller world grasp than than we do. So, where did we get these big brains? I mean, that's the puzzle. It is. It is a puzzle, and it would be strange if if instead of us, it was a bunch of dinosaurs that you know going around doing doing their thing, right? <laughs> well, it would be different, but perhaps someday we will encounter those eventualities if we if we travel far enough yes and for anyone who's listening who's who's new to this topic would you mind quickly telling us the difference between an asteroid a meteor and a fireball okay well asteroid is a rock in space it's called an asteroid to distinguish it from a comet we've been watching comets for thousands of years, of course, and comets have tails. They're releasing dust and gas because they have ices. Asteroids are rocks in space that look like stars. So asteroid just means they look like a star. That just means they don't have a tail. So the first asteroid wasn't discovered till I think it was 1801 when telescopes got better and better. I mean, naked eye comets, quote, happen all the time. So that's uh, where that word came from. The fireball is just a, a meteor that's bright enough. Well, formal definition is brighter than the planet Venus. Of course, they can be bright enough to make the ground light up like day. It's just the superheated air around a rock when it comes into the atmosphere. The average entry velocity is about 20 kilometers a second, and that is fast. So they slow down from going 20 kilometers a second to, let's say, one kilometer a second or hundreds of meters a second in four or five seconds. So that scrubs off a lot of energy, and a lot of that energy gets turned into that light. And, well, the meteorite, that's just a rock that comes from a meteor, so it's, it's just a piece of asteroid once we get it here in the ground. So am I correct in that you are somehow involved in talking about when that meteorite went through that person's roof and landed on their pillow? Oh, yes. That was uh, 
cold in BC October 3rd, last fall. And the woman was Ruth Hamilton. She was asleep in her bed, lights out. It's 11.33 uh, p.m. And she has a, well, a relatively small sheepdog, like a, a collie dog, a border collie. And the dog started barking in the dark. So she wakes up. And then she has this crash above her. And, and some plaster falls on her face. She's lying in bed. And, of course, gets up in the dark, turns on the light. And what's going on? And looks up. She has a hole in the ceiling of her bedroom over her bed. So what do you do? You dial 911. And of course, something hit my house. And so they sent over an RCMP officer to get the story. So while, you know, before the officer's there, she's looking around, she finds this dark gray rock under one of her pillows on her bed, near where her head was. And uh, so, of course, the officer gets there, shows him the rock. Of course, you can see there's a hole in her ceiling. I presume they went outside and they looked and they can see the hole in the top part of the roof too, you know, that old sheet roof. And he thought, well, well, just east of Golden, they're working on the highway there, twinning the Trans Canada. So they're, maybe they were blasting, so they blasted that rock over here. So the RCMP there, because of all the road closures, I guess they have the construction crews on speed dial, so they phoned them up. Were you just doing the blast? We had a rock through the roof here. And they say, no, but but we saw this big fireball in the sky and we heard the explosion boom later. So, oh, it might be a meteorite. So then they started talking about, was it a meteorite? Talk about, uh, well, a once in a lifetime experience and plus a, a close call. Yeah, I bet someone has calculated like the likelihood of that or how lucky she was or something like that. Well, of course it's, Let's say it's a, a one in a billion chance per year to happen to you or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, what could you explain what actually happened to the dinosaurs? Well, what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, you kind of have, if you're close to the impact site, of course, you died many times over in lots of different ways. The real question is, why did they die all over the planet? And we really still don't know that for sure. Uh, my favorite causes, uh, first, uh, we have uh, this dust layer at this Cretaceous tertiary. We now call it Cretaceous Paleogene boundary that you spoke of. So you can see this dust layer in the sediments from that time. And that dust in the atmosphere made it dark. So the whole planet got dark. And just because it's dark, you're not necessarily going to go extinct, but that made it cool as well. It's not clear exactly how cool. And of course, different places, you know, if you cool off the equator 20 degrees, say, it's not like you're making things freeze. However, the darkness presumably was enough, all the plants would have died. So if you kill all the plants, then everything that ate plants didn't have anything to eat. And then the things that ate the plant eaters wouldn't have anything to eat. So maybe you had an ecosystem collapse because all the plants died. The the rocks at Chibchulu had lots of uh, sulfates in them, particularly calcium sulfates we call anhydrite or gypsum. And so there was sulfuric acid uh, rain all over the planet. Maybe there was enough of this acid rain to kill things. I mean, it killed all the plants before the darkness got to them. Acidified the surface layer of the ocean. And uh, again, if all the plants are gone, you can imagine why everything is going to die. I guess those would be my, my top two things. Again, if you're close, I mean, there would have been heat and shock and all kinds of things, but something killed all of the, the dinosaurs in New Zealand too. So something that operated over the entire planet. The atmosphere changed a bit. There was more carbon dioxide in it. After the lights came back on, it would have been a, a long-term greenhouse of about 
or as much as five degrees C. But again, I wouldn't think that drove you know everything extinct because again, if you were a bit north, again, five degrees warmer isn't I think going to destroy your whole ecosystem. But but if someone out there knows exactly what happened and why, that would be handy to know. Uh, do people in your profession worry a lot about this happening again? Mm, I'll say yes. Uh, since that time, uh, Chibshalu was discovered in 1990. And that really made this idea of ex extinction caused by asteroid impact uh, to achieve a level of credibility it didn't have before, once you had the smoking gun, so to speak. So by 1992, just a couple of years later, you know, people were studying what it would take to you know, find these asteroids at that time. Uh, well, our technologies were not as good. I mean, that's just 30 years ago, but CCD cameras were just coming online. Uh, computers are just getting more sophisticated. But they're saying, well, we can put these things together and we can do a lot better job searching for asteroids. I was in grad school in the 80s. And like when I was starting grad school, there were maybe well, 100 near-Earth asteroids known. Now there's more than 20,000 because in the years since, I mean, people have been coming out with more and more sophisticated ground-based search telescopes and even some space-based uh, spacecraft that help search for them too. So long story short, back in the 1990s, people said, you know, let's buy an insurance policy here. It's highly likely none of the big asteroids in near Earth space are on an orbit that's going to hit Earth anytime soon. But we can know this for sure because we can find all those asteroids. And it's very likely we will find none of them is on an orbit that's going to impact the Earth anytime soon. And uh, well, NASA actually took this on and said, yes, we're going to do that. And well, the near-Earth asteroids that are, say, bigger than one kilometer diameter, more than 95% of them have been found. So we've, uh, in a sense, we bought the insurance policy. We know there's no big near-Earth asteroid that's going to hit us anytime soon. And then it comes down to, you know, are you worried about 10 meter diameter ones? Are you worried about 50 meter diameter ones? The one that came to Chelyabinsk in, uh, what was it, 2013? It was about 50 meters diameter because it came from towards the sun. And it wasn't found by any search telescope. And some people say, well, it, it's still handy to find these little ones because if it happened at a time of increased global tension, that you had a big fireball in a sensitive part of the world, someone might think someone had just launched a nuclear weapon and they might launch because you know they didn't have the technology to know the difference between an asteroid impact and a nuclear weapon. So uh, there may be something to that, of course. In any case, uh, people are still looking and finding more and more of them. So that's one natural disaster we probably don't have to worry about anytime soon. Naturally, the idea was, well, if you find an asteroid that's coming in is going to land in Vancouver, if you have some time, you can go into space and you can take the asteroid and you can alter its orbit a little bit so it's going to miss Earth. So you completely avoid the natural disaster. And, and people are now you know, working at Know, how do we best deflect an asteroid? This September, in fact, there's a mission called DART, which is going to whack a near-Earth asteroid, actually, its moon, and see how much its orbit changes. Wow, that's amazing. It sounds like a movie, but real life. And um, you did mention in there about uh, earlier on with what you were saying about a little layer around that, you know, Trace back to the to the crater in the in 1990. Could I know you get asked this a lot, but could you just tell us a little bit more about about how you found that? 
well, it's you know pretty simple. You have a crater. The the effects of the impact are are bigger or greater closer to it. Uh, when the Alvarez's and Helen Michael and Frank Asaro first published this theory back in 1980, they were looking at thin clay layers, a few millimeters thick, from three sites on the Earth, so one in Gubbio, Italy, one in Stevens Clint, Denmark, and one at Woodside Creek, New Zealand. So the first paper they could say, well, we can find this layer all around the world, but literally the layer was a few millimeters thick. It had these geochemical anomalies. People may have heard of the iridium anomalies and so on, and came out with this theory. And uh, very controversial at the time. And one argument was, well, look, if you're saying there's this great big impact, why are you showing me this thin layer of clay instead of great big jumbled breaches and so on? So when I went back to grad school, which was 1984, I uh, started looking for places where there wasn't just a thin clay layer, but there were great big jumbled piles of stuff, which would indicate you were getting close to the crater. And uh, two scientists, American scientists, Tom Ahrens and John O'Keefe, published a paper, well, Earth is mostly ocean, so this impact probably had in the ocean. And if you had this big impact in the ocean, you would have made giant waves. And those waves would have initially eroded the deep sea floor and traveled to the deep ocean, come to the edge of continents, and of course, then our giant waves grow again, eroded the sediments and made big jumbled deposits in the edge of the continents. So I started looking for those and found them uh, between North and South America. So for me, that located the, the region of impact between North and South America. And that, well, suffice to say, was not a popular idea at the time. So what else can you do to test it? If you're close to the impact site, this layer, which was just a millimeter thick, not part of the world ought to be much thicker. And it turned out there was a deposit known on the island of Haiti. And it turned out it was indeed ejected only was a half meter thick, which is a lot thicker than a few millimeters. So that convinced many people that indeed the impact was not part of the world. And well, there had been a suggestion of an impact crater buried on the Yucatan Peninsula, the northwest corner of the Yucatan Peninsula, and only took, uh, oh, actually a few more months to, in fact, prove that that was an impact crater. That was also an unpopular idea at the time. And of course, it turns out that Chibchulub is where that asteroid hit the Earth 66 million years ago. It survived all the tests since, and most people have stopped fighting about, you know, whether or not there was an impact and <laughs> there was an extinction. Although it's it still continues in some way. Yeah, it seems that it would. <laughs> and um, so, so we don't want to take up too much of your time, but I did show you the. Um, the little video that I made for the end of this uh, chat that we have here, um, but it's not scientifically accurate. Would you mind just letting us know why before we do that? And then we also do have to talk about uh, the whole reason we're here, other than to talk about this natural disaster stuff was the International Asteroid Day. So could you let us know a bit about the video? <laughs> well, I mean, the video is, is fun. It's just, uh... I mean, the asteroid is fun, it's rotating and down impacts the Earth. It's, the atmosphere of the Earth is only 100 kilometers thick. So, uh, I mean, a big impact will blow a hole through the atmosphere and then the rock just comes streaming out in a curtain. There's not a rolling smoke like we get from an explosion. And the fireball would just expand a, a big glowing hemisphere. It, the, the fireball in the video looks more like a a nuclear weapon where you initially have the fireball and then that has a slow density it it you know floats up in the air by buoyancy and makes this mushroom cloud so the 
the animation you put together looks well, kind of mushroomy, cloudy, and an asteroid more has an ejector curtain. And then, of course, it's the fireball system blasting out of the atmosphere without without floating. Yes, that's perfect because people will see that in a few minutes. Um, and then, so International Asteroid Day that we're going to um, talk about June thirtieth is a very special day. Do you do you like that day? <laughs> so. Asteroid Day, uh, honestly, it's more than 10 years now it's been running. It's to, uh, of course, have awareness of the potential for impacts. It's the anniversary of the Tunguska impact in 1908, when a, a big piece of something, a comet or an asteroid, uh, exploded over Tib Siberia and, and knocked down trees for about a well, 15 or 20 kilometer radius. It's the biggest impact we've had in historical times, let's say. So, uh, I mean, various uh, groups uh, support this. This year, I think it's Dr. Mark Boslow, who's the, the leader or coordinator for the Asteroid Day activities. He studies uh, impacts he simulates them with computers i mean this business of what the fireballs look like and so on that's the kind of research that he does if you remember back in 1994 pieces of comet shoemaker levy 9 impacted jupiter and mark uh, correctly predicted the height the fireballs would grow to on the side of jupiter about 3300 kilometers high He's uh, well, deep into the business of simulating impacts and asking questions. If we were hit by this, what would happen? And that's the sort of thing that he does. But there are dozens and dozens of asteroid researchers who are uh, participating in Asteroid Day with, well, with public available talks about this and that. So um, it was interesting and very relevant for this channel that you mentioned that people aren't super worried about another thing like this happening anytime soon so it, that is something i just wanted to highlight that is that links it to our channel one of the things we try to do is um, bring science into it a little bit to de-escalate some of the fear because a lot of things um, we don't need to worry about them uh, too much and I wanted to ask you two more things. Uh, we're gonna wrap up here in a second, but what is next for you with your research? What are you excited about to go to go look at next? Well, lots of things. Uh, <clears throat> I'm involved in a, a NASA mission called the Cirrus Rex. It's sent a spacecraft with a Canadian instrument on it to map a near Earth asteroid named Bennu, a small one only about 500 meters diameter. After mapping it, it sample site was selected and it went to the surface of the asteroid and uh, well, grabbed uh, pieces of it and it's on its way back to earth now and they'll get back here in 2023 so we're preparing uh, techniques to study those pieces of asteroids so we can better constrain its its geologic history but i can tell you just one little story about you were just saying it's it's good we can reassure people that things like this aren't likely to happen soon. And back in the 1990s, after this impact hazard became a bit more real, there were a couple of movies done, uh, Deep Impact and Armageddon, about you know asteroid disasters on Earth. And uh, I was investigating a fireball that happened out here in Alberta, oh, one of those years, maybe it was early 2000s and um, a man and his son young son know, let's say five years old were out and they saw a fireball you know this meteorite falling in the alberta prairie and uh and the, the boy started crying and his father was oh what's what's wrong son and he said well we just had that impact now the whole world's going to be destroyed because the the sun had seen one of these disaster movies so he he thought he had seen an asteroid strike near so it's good to reassure people 
Um, I did notice in the chat that uh, Homestead Aquarius asked, and I know there were some other questions that I have missed, and I apologize for that, but we are going to put links to some of uh, Dr. Hillebrand's research and some other YouTube videos below that he is in, so you can learn more about the topic. So hopefully that answers some of your questions, but he, um, Homestead Aquarius did ask, was there any impact disaster movies that were at all accurate? That were actually good depictions of the situation. Well, frankly, Armageddon. I think it had Bruce Willis, and I would say I like it better as a movie, but it was a lot worse <laughs> describing asteroids. And Deep Impact had uh, the science a little bit better. I mean, it has uh, you know the giant impact wave coming ashore and so on, and and that is uh, more real. And they had a a better, well, let's say size object i think in armageddon they actually said it was texas sized or something so the science was a little bit better in, in deep impact there have been others since but honestly uh well none particularly stands out i'll say yeah yeah that's that's what i thought um and then one last question was there anything in your grand canyon river trip that you remember as being a, a great memory or something fun? Well, Jumping off the cliffs. <laughs> the, Grand, the Grand Canyon trip, uh, well, uh, again, I'm very thankful that you and Jerry set it up. I'll say, I think, well, the, there were many great moments. I'll, I'll say, if you remember, close to the end there we had a little bit of a thunderstorm and we could see the flash floods coming over <laughs> a couple thousand feet above us into well, foot high waterfalls i'd say that was a great way to see a flash flood yeah i thought i thought we were gonna have some problems at nighttime camping along the river with the water increasing that was that was crazy i was a little worried Oh, you didn't look worried. Oh, good. Good. I never want to look worried. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. There's some great comments I can see that you can always look at later. People saying things like, thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, just I know people really learned a lot from you being here and taking the time. Also, thank you to anybody who's taken the time to listen to this chat that we have. Uh, stay tuned for asteroid day um, we'll definitely post something about it and, and let's just try to learn more we can all learn more about these natural earth phenomenon and uh, we will as mentioned have links to dr hillebrand's uh, research and things you can learn more about the topics below so thank you very much and uh, have a good evening <laughs>